And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple. A w s someone who is as much as much of a me as much of a mech junkie as the re as the rest of us, and and pro and is on and is on her way to having a TTRPG library about as large as mine, eventually. <laughs> and the cre and the creator of the in development project All Systems Go. The one and only Nami Nomi, or is it Nomi Nami? No, it isn't. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. How about you? I'm doing good. It is cooled off a little bit where I am, and it's and this is one more opportunity I have to do to um content to continually continuously pick on the likes of Gigic when he did that whole Mecha is dead in the West argument. <laughs> oh God, yeah. <laughs> I I like actually had a friend show me that uh, a while back because he watches Gigguk endlessly and I was like I I don't know about that. Hey, I when Super Robot Wars Thirty had its pre-order launch and managed to get to the top of the Steam charts, um, I distinctly remember te that my brother had tagged Gigguk and used his own words against him. Because he and I are petty motherfuckers. But I'd like but I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings. Um, mm -hmm. um uh, I'll start with the I'll start with the mech side of things, but mm -hmm. how did, what was your what was your introduction to to gi to giant robots? Mechas uh my, so, I I distinctly remember seeing, like, Gundam Wing on Toonami, but also my sister's boyfriend at the time had a bunch of, like, uh, anime VHSs, and he just was like, I don't really want these anymore, here you go, and it had, like, it had copies of Gundam Wing, it had copies of Evangelion, it had copies of Escaflown, a bunch of other random stuff just cobbled together. Uh, and that was my introduction. It was a bunch of those like '90s mecha animes, and that got me like sold as a kid. <laughs> I was like five at the time, maybe six. Okay. I get, um, do you, when it comes to mechs and mech design, do you prefer mm -hmm. um, do you prefer them stompy or do you prefer them spiky? Mm -hmm. I, I definitely think a little bit more stompy than spiky, to be honest. Um, like thinking about it, yeah. Like I, I like most of the um, like classic Gundam designs a whole lot more than some of the more modern stuff. Which is not to necessarily downplay it. I still like mechas. It's just I have a love for like grunt types. Um, I think the the better way for me to put the whole stompy and spiky thing is is the is the scaling. There's already the the line between stop between super robot and real robot, but Mm -hmm. It's more of, do you prefer the concept of mecha as tanks with legs or the more power armor leaning approach that well was pioneered with Gundam? Oh yeah, more the more the power armor type stuff. Um, you're talking like kind of like more like the the typical um, they call it uh, well like Gundam style versus uh, like BattleTech is a little bit more like tanks almost. Mm -hmm. Well, with BattleTech, they pretty much are tanks with legs. Yeah, they yeah they pretty much are. I mean, the Atlas might as well just be a set of guns with legs. Uh, no, but yeah, I definitely lean no, more because, towards the armored side because we are, we already have we already have a set of gun a set of guns with legs in in BattleTech. It's called the Rifleman, <laughs> and the, and the catapult. I was going to oh, say that I think the catapult the that's and the the trebuchet legs. is yeah, yeah the trebuchet the stalker. Um, one might ar one might argue the Marauder, yeah. Uh, but and and um, I, how could I how could I forget? No curb the Irby. <laughs> I'm trying to remember that one off the top urban of my head. mech. 
Oh, okay. Yep, Which yep, is just yep. a trash can with legs and a gun. And then there's the baby little locust, which you can put a lot of gun on that thing, surprisingly, <laughs> for how little leg there is. Mm -hmm. But give, given the, and to be to be quite honest, when you mentioned um, Grunt, one of the one of the ones that immediately came to mind is Scope Dog from Votoms. I'm trying to remember what that design actually looks like. Oh. Uh, I will... Because that's... I don't think that's one I've actually seen off the top of my head. Um, if it helps, he... If, nope, can't can't send that. It's too long. I was trying to send... I was trying to send an image, an image link, and it turned it into a... It turned it into a text file. Nope. <laughs> that... Oh, yeah. Wrong. Okay, yeah. Um... Yeah, I definitely I love little grunt type mechs a lot. Uh, I don't know. There's something kind of cute about them. Um, I think they're very like humble, a little bit more on like a grounded side, but still has like the mecha aesthetic, and I always kind of like that. For whatever reason, I get the feeling you were fond of the Eighth MS team and for that aesthetic. I've seen chunks of Eighth MS team, but never gotten my hands on like like a full copy to be able to actually watch it and it drives me nuts because like actually finding uh box sets or dvds for bandai stuff can be a giant headache but yes the answer is yes i do remember somebody making a parody version of of the of the eighth ms team um just switch just swiping swiping out the music with the a team theme and it ends <laughs> up working a little bit too well i can kind of see that actually yeah but I'd what I find what I find interesting what I find interesting about about that approach is I think a lot of people um, underestimate the amount of variety when it comes to do, when it comes to doing a mech project to the point where I remember um, I remember someone someone asking me to recommend them a mech RPG and I'm like that's I you need to be a little more specific. Yeah, um, I, I've i actually discovered that myself working on ASG because when I was talking to people about it, I would get people being like, oh, so like Gundam. And I'm like, yeah. And then somebody would be like, oh, so you mean like um, like like Evangelion or Escaflown or like, and then I, I realized I was like, oh, right. I didn't even think about that. You could do some of those like kind of crazier things in that too. Uh, well, I had to like realize you, there is a surprising variety. Yeah. Speaking of that, what what would be your origin story when it comes to tabletop RPGs? Um, I started with D and D third edition when I was like eleven or twelve. Uh, older brother's friend introduced us, and uh, I had a very bizarre experience because my first actual couple games were genuinely awful, like some of the worst games I think I've ever experienced. Because the the guy we had running was honestly just kind of like a very malicious gm it was very frustrating oh, but he's a having that gm yeah basically i mean it was it was i don't really want to go into a whole story because it's a whole long thing but it was awful but having looked through the books i was like i could see that there was a lot to it so i picked up some copies of third edition and then i started gming from there um and that like that set me off on a a long path of, of playing these games. It was just out of like the curiosity and a lot of inspiration from uh, third edition because something about the aesthetic of like third edition D and D captivated my tiny child brain. I'm not sure why. I there's there's plenty there's plenty of possibilities. Um, I could easily I could easily see the um to the imitation tome design that that book had, which. Pit, which pissed off a lot of the a lot of the old heads at the time. Mm -hmm. Even though I've mentioned this in the past, but but people seem to have a seem to have seem to have had a mass hallucination regarding the reception of um, third edition. Like I think a lot of people forget how hated it was in its early years. Yeah, I um. 
having started with third, I didn't see it, but I I have heard a lot of that as well online that like a lot of people who came from second edition really didn't like third. And when I when I look and compare third to second and even previous rather than like first edition, and they like three different versions there is of that. Uh, I can kind of see why it, people would be kind of upset with how many different changes there were, the tonal changes, the inclusion of certain kinds of classes that people maybe didn't like thematically. Um, I heard the monk was controversial a little bit, um, but yeah. Um, the pre-3E pre e monk is trash. I'm just going to put that out there right now. <laughs> It it is it is not good. It is t it is a tier four. It was a tier four class. Is it possible you can get it to work? Yeah, much in the same way it's possible you can get a Bethesda game to run stable by lo by loading it up with mods. Which, yeah, loading up with mods to the point where it breaks. Yeah. Which I, which is a kit is akin to is akin to somebody want somebody wanting a somebody wanting a Disney princess doll for Christmas and get and getting a action figure of Princess Leia. <laughs> You're technically correct, but you kind of missed the point. Mm -hmm. But even though even though I I personally enjoyed 3E and I understand I understood what it was trying to do. That's not going to stop me from picking on some of its mistakes, and <laughs> I've um I while he's mellowed out now, I had I had picked on Monty Cook quite a bit back in the day because of, because of some of his attitudes. Yeah, no, uh, uh, for sure, Monty Cook. I'm trying to remember Monty Cook published. Why can I not think of what game they published recently? Um. They're responsible for the cipher system. He's responsible for yep, the cipher, cipher system. Yeah, Okay, that's what it was. Um, Numenera, the strange, all, all of that, all of that good stuff. Mm -hmm. But he had this attitude of system mastery should be rewarded and system ignorance should be punished. Oh yeah. Which I I had jokingly said is is that the is that the reason why is that the reason why there's why there's um. More, why there's so many traps in the feet, in the feet list? Yeah, that was actually one of my biggest complaints about third edition was the number of, of trap feats that were genuinely like I could not see a point to them other than for them to be traps. And then I learned later on that that was intentional, and I I still do not like that at all. I still think it's a terrible idea. Um. Or and if it's and if it's not traps, there there were there were certain feats that just the prereqs for them were excessive. the The one that's been my whipping boy for years is whirlwind attack. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, with the amount of pay to not suck that you have to deal with, and just anybody who wants to do dual wielding, which dual wielding is a fantasy in a in is something we see in a lot of fantasy fiction and otherwise. So people are going to want to carry that over into their role playing games, and the rules for dual wielding were not good because of I the amount of stuff you had to do just to not suck at it. I remember me and my cousin making characters for something, and he was like looking at the the lineup and all the requirements for for uh, dual wielding, and he just said to me, "I think the game just doesn't want me to dual wield," <laughs> and I was like, "It kind of feels that way, doesn't it?" The argument I remember hearing was that it was to make it so that dual wielding didn't become too useful. Um, mm. But I distinctly remember house ruling it out where dual wielding operated on a die flip rule. I.e., you could, i.e., you could, you could essentially flip the die over, so 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 a so a five would become a fifteen, for instance, and you would and you would just do less damage. Oh, okay. Huh, oh. that's an interesting one. Because it it's a way to give it's a way to give you a second chance, but it's not one you want to rely on all that much. Yeah, for sure. Oh, but of course, of course, there were bigger there were bigger problems. Um, 
I don't I don't want to get into the magic problem again. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's the thing I've discussed to death, too, because, like, having played third and Pathfinder as well uh, a lot, there it's it's a thing I think I've discussed to death at this point. I, I have heard rumors that Skip Williams really, really hated sorcerers in um, third. Hmm. I don't know why. And to be and to be fair, the 3.0 version of Sorcerer was not great. Yeah. Because a lot of the bloodline stuff that people associate with sorcerers now wasn't present. It was just, it was just a, it was just a wizard with slightly less spells, but didn't have to prep, which didn't amount to much. But, um, uh, I've I've put I for me I've been on I've been on the outs with with certain people with different editions because I have been very critical of things that are considered traditions. Hmm. Um, yeah. One of the one of the big ones is the way fighters get treated. As in, yeah, in third edition, they were better known as the feeter. <laughs> and that whole that whole the selling point with the fighter is supposed to be they can equip any weapon. But in practice, most I'm pretty and you probably had the same thing. Most people are going to stick to one particular loadout for their adventuring careers. Yep. And they're going to invest their feet super heavily into that one particular loadout. And any time they are forced to not use that loadout, they kind of become not completely useless, but their power shrinks down significantly. So people just don't. They're like, I have this thing, this particular, okay, I'm going to build a sword and board character. And they're like, I'm never going to switch from anything but this ever. Yeah. Um, one way that I put it, because some of my some of my students were Final Fantasy XI players, is mm -hmm. the warrior in FF11 can equip any melee weapon. In practice, you're going to be equipping a great axe, simply because it's the one it's the one weapon that wor that works the absolute best with the warrior's kit. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, which is why I wasn't surprised when 14 comes along and just drops the pretense about the matter. Um, but I would, if you don't mind, I'd like to play a little bit of a lightning round when it comes to Mac TTRPGs about sure. uh, and insofar as whether you've either heard of these or played them. It's gonna be a kind of small list for played. Be, actually, it it will be an it will be like a microscopic list for played. Um, I've heard that before. <laughs> yeah, I do know about a bunch of them, um, but we'll get into it in a minute, I guess. Yeah. Okay, let me start with the big one, Mechton. No, I've read it, not played it. Everyone looks at it and goes, I don't know. Um, I will admit Mechton is, is on the advanced end of things. Um, yeah, and it's interlock, which people always kind of look at with a funny eye for some reason. I don't know why. Well, they'll look at it with a funny eye and le unless they're playing Cyberpunk. Mm-hmm. Which, but it's this, or more recently, The Witcher. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, I forgot about that. I know some people will say that you can use D&D &D to do The Witcher. No, you can't. <laughs> no, you you really can't. It's not the same at all. That, and Im imagine trying to put the whole spell charges thing on the, on the signs. Oh, God, yeah, no, that wouldn't work either. Oh. Like, the magic just works different. That's the reason why I've, whenever some, whenever somebody says that you can run any kind of fantasy with D and D, I, I, I feel, I feel I'm, I feel I'm obliged to, to embarrass that assertion. I always just say you can kind of do that, kind of. It's not really like gonna be the greatest experience though. Well, if you can put a, you can put a square peg into a round hole if you have enough strength. <laughs> yeah, that's actually a really good analogy. Oh, I remember. I remember Tex making a joke about how the how the officers academy for Capellans has a has a has a test where you have to put bl blocks of various shapes into various holes. This results in two types of officers: those who are moderately intelligent, and those who are very strong. 
<laughs> oh, that's pretty good too. But I mean, just and just as somebody who en who enjoys a lot of who enjoys a lot of samurai films, um, and the f one of the big lo one of the pro one of the popular loadouts for fighters is sword and board. I always tell those people explain how explain how you're going to how somebody's going to do a sword and board set how sword and board is going to be used in a culture that doesn't use shields. Yeah, yeah. And that that's just that's just one example of 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 that kind of thing. Um, I know that D and D fifth edition tried to argue that a tried to argue a samurai class is a reskinned paladin, which no. Um, no, no, I don't think so. That's wor that's worse than the samurai class that was in Complete Warrior, which yeah, dear, dear lord, that sucked. Yeah, the samurai classes for third all are like I think there's two of them actually. I want to say, and I there, know the complete there, warrior one is awful. <laughs> the complete warrior one is awful. The one in Oriental Adventures is somewhat better, even if it's just a slightly modified fighter. Um, but truth be truth be told, it, truth be told, since so much of so much of Oriental Adventures is cr is cribbing from Legend of the Five Rings, I'd rather just play L5R. But, That's a good point, actually. Because uh, ins instead of using the Karator setting that they used in AD and D, they decided to mer They decided to dip into L five R. No idea why. Uh, but continuing on with the with the lightning round, um, right? Yeah. Battle Century G. I actually haven't heard of that. I don't think. It was originally known as Giant Guardian Generation, and was heavily inspired by Super Robot Wars. But eventually, when he wanted to go legit with it, he took all the stuff that would have that would have gotten would have gotten um, Band Bandai Namco's atten attention and just released it as Battle Century G. Hmm. Yeah, I'm actually I I see this on on. Uh, drive through. When did this come out? If you know, this, this came out a few years ago, and I did do a review of it. Um, and fortunately, there's a system reference document version of both of both the main game and its sums, um, its primary supplement, Battle Century Z. Oh, okay. But it's one of the rare cases of tr of having of having a setup for both the mech and the pilot. But I'll go. I'll go with a bit with a more well-known instance, um, Lancer. The, yep, I, I've uh, I've not played Lancer. I own a copy of it. I've read through it. Uh, it's another one of those that I pitch to players, and I I get a. I think with my players, they they didn't. I say my players. I mean with the people I pitched it to, who um, it's like four or five people. I got mixed things. Like some people didn't really like the setting, and some people looked at like the 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 way i think it's their, their kind of classes in that game um worked and they like just completely were like eh, uninterested and i'm like well shit i just dropped like 40 bucks on this people were just completely i don't i don't even know why i don't know why it was so hard to sell people on that um because the system seems good the system it the system is it take it takes a lot of nods from D D fourth edition and shadow of the demon lord I did notice that, yeah. Like I read through it, and I was like, "This does feel like kind of like fourth edition," which somebody had told me that beforehand too. But I, but I have a, hard, I have a, but as far, but when I covered Lancer, I didn't really see classes within it because. Well, of, yeah, I meant. Sorry, go ahead. Because of how, the, because of how, uh, mech use and development works. Oh. Uh, there's definitely. It's far more of it's far more of a license based approach, since in that setting, Max can be three D printed. So you're not buying Max; you're buying the um, blueprint for Max. Right. Right. Yeah. Um. But now, with with the next one, I feel sorry for you if you ever tried to run this, um, Robotech. I'm talking the OG, the OG one, not the <laughs> not the one by Strange Machine, which is better. I've never tried to run it. I have looked at it. Um, yeah, it didn't. 
it didn't really gel with me. Uh, I think, God, I think I looked at that like five, six years ago, maybe even more than that. Um, it just did not gel with me when I read through the rules. I mean, I don't even remember how the game actually functions because I took a, a glance at it and was like, It uses nope. the same, it's from Palladium and it uses the same Palladium Megaversal system. Okay. Which okay. is also used by Rifts. And unfortunately, Rifts has been my whipping boy for most of my life. I'm almost curious why, because I haven't really messed with Rifts too much. I always get recommended it once in a while, and I just never end up picking it. I like the setting of Rifts. This ga yeah. this Gonzo, this Gonzo tricked-out science fantasy approach. Mm -hmm. I like that. The rule set, at least with the original Palladium version, is a, is a jumbled mess. The books suffer suffer from one of my one of the cardinal sins of ha of having a table of contents filled with lies and there's the fact that I have to that I have to do extensive house ruling uh, in order to make it work for me and mm. I've had the policy that house ruling should be a spice not the main dish that's a fair I think that's a fair rule of thumb to be frank like if it doesn't function at least on a bare minimum out of the box it's a little hard to want to run it. I mean, I'm going I'm going to house rule any anyways just because that's what I do. Yeah, for sure, same. And I'll I'll house rule bo I'll house rule board games if I fe if I feel like it. <laughs> and the version of Uno that I had had a collection of house rules within it. Mhm. Mm but I but I shouldn't have to. If I I can certainly agree there. If I have to house rule in order to in order to get something to work, then that's a problem. Now, since you since you mentioned um, Evangelion at one at one point, mm -hmm. um, I'll throw I'll throw in Bliss Stage into the into the mix. Don't think I've heard of that one actually. Bliss Stage was one of the early attempts to try and do a Ava inspired. TTRPG. Hmm. By early, do you mean like nineties, two thousands, two thousands? Ooh. Um. Hmm. The nineties were a bit of a crazy time when it came to TTRPG history. Yeah. And the, there's a lot of games from the nineties that I have that I that I won't run because because they're a bit too crunchy. I just use them as a threat whenever somebody complains about a game being too complicated. <laughs> um. <laughs> I think I brought up I think I brought up one of them once when I said that the um alien RPG by Free League is the second time somebody's tried to, to tackle aliens in TTRPG form. The first was the Aliens Adventure game which uses the same rules as Phoenix Command and Phoenix Command is on the list of games I will not run unless I'm getting paid. Oh god. Yeah. Um yeah, I was going to say, I don't think there's many alien RPGs. I, to be honest, I thought that the Free League one might have been the first, but I'm like, there's no way. There's got to be one. No, the, um, the Aliens Adventure game, I think, came out in 94. Don't quote okay. me on that. I, I keep thinking either 92 or 94. And it, I think a lot of people put up with it most because of a lack of alternatives, but it was not what I would consider good. And some developers had this idea of trying to make their games as detailed as possible, even with details that that didn't actually matter. And this is one of those cases. Mm, I feel like that's a surprising like it's a trend in like the '90s and 2000 RPGs, like. 2000s is not so 2000s not so much 90s and late 80s definitely yeah um uh, but the this one this one is a bit of a deep cut but i but mm -hmm. i'd be remiss if i didn't bring up um adeptus evangelion i feel like i've heard of it never looked at it or touched it I'll, I'll be real. I, I have never wanted to actually run like an Evangelion style RPG game, uh, partially because it, it always the concept of putting it into an RPG, uh, like a like a campaign, 
has always seemed a little odd to me. And every time I pitched it, people have been like, no, absolutely not. I do not want to play Evangelion. And I'm like, fair enough. So when I when I saw that, I don't even know where I saw it. Um, I just was like, eh, that's neat, but no. Um, I've I've been, I've kept, I've kept an eye. At Ava is is one is an interesting pro- project by fans, mm-hmm. and one that and one that can be setting divorced. In fact, that in fact when I okay. read it, I didn't even use the 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 um. I I instead of taking the, instead of taking the approach that the sh- that the show did, I ended up using that as a template to build my own setting with the with the um, Ava units. Being th- being themed or being themed around, um, I themed both the Ava units and the angels around the tarot. The Ava units themselves were were each representative of one of of one of the four suits of the minor arcana, and all of the angels were or the equivalent of angels were the major. Okay, that's actually a pretty neat idea. I'm not gonna lie. Um... I hadn't really considered about or looking at it to see if I could, you know, crowbar in another setting, but yeah. might have um, to take a second look. I will admit I had an easy I had an easier time pitching at Avo after Pacific Rim came out. Oh, okay. Um I think I think some other people had, had um taken the Pacific Rim concept and really went to town with it setting wise. Which is a fair point because it's a setting that you that there's a whole lot more stories you can t- you can tell. Mm-hmm. Um, speaking of speaking of that, are you were you be familiar at all with Cthulhu Tech? Um, you know that sounds really familiar. Um, but I don't. I'm not really familiar. Mm-hmm. I've honestly, I think I've heard of more RPGs than I've touched. There are a countless numbers at this point. Yeah. <laughs> um, which. The best way for me to describe Cthulhu Tech is is throwing Macross, Silent Mobius, and and the Cthulhu Mythos in a blender, and that and throw really in a little bit of Giver while we're at it. It's the on, the only the only problem was the dice system that it had was un, was unfortunately kind of swingy. Hmm. Or you'd you'd either do because it was built around either rolling um either rolling straights or sets. You're rolling d tens, but you're aiming for straights or sets, and there wasn't a parachute mechanic like say the river mechanic in Weapons of the Gods to he- to help to help um stabilize it. So you're either gonna roll really well, or you're gonna roll like shit. Yeah, I can I can kind of see that. Um, uh, and, and yeah, go ahead. The river mechanic in Weapons of the Gods basically allowed you to bank dice that you weren't using, and then you oh. and then use them on then use them on other results. Okay. Y- yeah, I was I was that's actually a pretty good solution to that. To be frank. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that's a neat way to fix that because I know I've heard people come. Does Cthulhu Tech use the same system as like the modern Cthulhu, or no? Those are two. Compl- well, okay, when you talk that's about what the- I thought. When when you talk about the modern Cthulhu, the pro- the problem is there. There, I have to I have to ask which one because you. You're right. Of course, you have Call of Cthulhu, which uses Chaosium's basic role playing since day which one. Which is the D100, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, no, I'm I'm just trying to remember. They, I get them mixed up a little bit. Yeah. There's Trail of Cthulhu, which used Kenneth Height's um, gumshoe system, which was which was tailor built for investigative style play. And there was the Fate of Cthulhu thing, but that was a massive disappointment. I'd re- I don't like talking about Fate of Cthulhu. Is that just Fate Cthulhu then? I'm assuming. Yeah, but instead. It's... Um... That's what people would ass- that's what people would assume and it but instead they decided to do this ridiculous time travel story instead of, instead of just instead of just use, utilizing what's already present and what pe- what people would assume no it's instead about people go- going from the future to the past to stop to stop the stars becoming right 
Ah, okay. Which, I... which, first off, if you wanted to write a Terminator game, just write a Terminator game. <laughs> <laughs> That's a fair point. That's a fair point. I mean, yeah, there's there's a Terminator game in, in the works now, but, I, but nobody knew that at the time. Mm-hmm. Um, but... Speaking of that, what prompted you? What prompted you to want to want to make a Mac TTRPG of your own? Was it was it just something you had been kicking around for a while, or how how did it go about? Um, it actually started with homebrewing a mecha system in Savage Worlds, uh, because that was my at the time was the system I was using for a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Um. That was more the catalyst, I guess, because I had not really run too much mecha stuff. Uh, it was a, it was a while back, like we did maybe two, three, four years. I'm not even sure at this point. Um, and one of my groups was like kind of getting tired of fantasy stuff, and I'm like, hey, well, we could always try some mecha stuff. And I pitched a lot of things, um, and I think most of them got turned down. And they were like, well, we know how to play Savage Worlds. Can't you homebrew something in that? And I was like, yeah, I can. So I, I just did that, and we ended up doing it as like a short campaign um and we i think we continued using this the homebrew savage world system the, of course the problem being it's a it's a it was like a crowbarred really quick like i built it in like two weeks system so it was really flawed mm -hmm. um however i had already had a lot of experience building for like other games and i was starting to really actually enjoy playing uh mecha campaigns and whatnot um there was initially a bit of I don't want to say hesitation, but kind of hesitation, or like I guess uh, a struggle with running mecha type games, just because the setting is a little different, and I had been running fantasy for so long. Mm -hmm. But uh, I feel like once you get into the flow of like how you sort of uh, run and write for you know mecha games, it 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 starts to get a little easier. So after running the campaign for like well over a year, I started working on ASG. Mm -hmm. um, and I had already read a bunch of the other systems. Did want to try them, still want to. I still want to get a group to try a bunch of those. Um, but once again, a lot of them have issues when I try to pitch them. Uh, maybe I'm not good at selling RPGs to my friends. I'm not sure which. Uh, but usually I get some mixed responses. Um, either people don't want to learn new systems, or people find things like Mechton to be too crunchy, um, or they don't like the way the interlock system sounds. Or um, in a weird, bizarre turn of events, though, I had the opposite problem with Mecha Hack because I also own that. I've read through it, and uh, I got the opposite problem where people are like, "There's not enough crunch," which is kind of ironic. Um, but um, I, yeah. if I were in that, if I were in that conversation, I'd pro I'd probably end up saying, "What?" I'd probably end up asking him, "Do any of you do any of you have a woven up basket and go and go around in a red hood?" <laughs> I mean, it 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 feels like it sometimes. Getting like trying to sell people on RPGs can be surprisingly difficult. Um, I've had an easier time sell selling people, but I think but I think there's a few unfair advantages I have. One being reputation, and the other being, um, I literally tower over all of my students. <laughs> I'm six six, and I have to deal with tall guy problems. Oh my god! Yeah, you were you were tall then. Um, wow. Yeah, I'm I'm like five eight. I am tiny in comparison. And the unfortunate thing is that is I've is I've I've added I've broken at least one exit sign off of my head. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. that's gotta hurt. Oh, it does. It's more in it. It's more annoyance than pain. Oh. Um. I I think admittedly sometimes uh pitching new games is or like like for example if i were to be like hey you guys want to try like old school essentials people would probably have an easier time because they're like oh it's like D, &D. they like kind of know it now that i've got more groups that have played in like mecha and sci-fi stuff it might be easier now but uh, a couple years ago it wasn't it, it was not easy at all mm -hmm. um but having essentially kind of tried actually running mecha games doing it for a while enjoying it quite a bit um i i just started reading a bunch of other systems and some of them were my own dislikes of them like like for example for me with mecha hack i agreed i was like i don't think there's enough in there 
for me to want to run a campaign for a year or two or however long. Well, I was like, I could probably run it for six or seven. Well, apparently the devs agreed with you, given that the given that expanded version of the book. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and um, I actually need to get around to getting that. Um, they produce they produce some other stuff for it too, like the the mission module thing they were working on. Yeah, um, I um. I've t- I, I've had the I've had the creator of that on the sh- on the show here. Okay, I'm, I might have to. I don't. I think I might have missed that one. I might I might have to go back and find that because um, uh, Matt, right? Yeah, it was okay. it was a while ago. It was long before I met you. Okay. But I may still have to watch that because uh, I I do like Matt. Uh, he seems like he's a interesting fella. Mm-hmm. Um. But I, I will ad- I will admit that much to much to the chagrin of much to the chagrin of some of of, of some of my some of my predecessors I mm-hmm. have used I ha- I have used um video games as a as a lead in like when mm-hmm. I wanted to run a the last time I wanted to run a mech campaign I had I had utilized um the Titanfall games as the ba- as the base and saying look at this this is what I want to do. That's a that's a good idea. Um, we we kind of got that when I ran the original campaign in Savage Worlds because one of our one of our players had just got done finishing uh, watching. It wasn't a video game; it was an anime, but it still worked as a good representation. They just finished um, Iron Blooded Orphans, yeah. and he was like, "I want to run that so bad." And I was like, "Okay." And the other two players were like, "That looks kind of cool," and that did admittedly help sell them. Um, because I think like what you were talking about earlier, where there's a, such a variety, is maybe when you say mecha, people don't entirely know what to expect, maybe. Or they all have their own different ideas of what you mean when you say a mecha campaign. Mm-hmm. And when it comes... The thing, the thing is, um, I end up getting myself in trouble once upon a time because of, because of the fact that I defended... Um, Tome of Battle, the Book of Nine Swords. Hmm. Because a lot of people cried foul about it, about it taking inspiration from vi- from video games and anime. And the mindset that I had at the time wa- was, you're go- you're going to be dealing with a whole generation of players and game designers who did not grow up with Tolkien, did not grow up with Howard, did not grow up with more. With Morcock or Le- or Lieber, mm-hmm. or for, or for Zeta and and so on, not to, not to disparage their not to disparage their work, but this this is just a fact. Yeah, they 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 grew up with uh, with other forms of 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 um, inspiration when it comes to fantasy, and their work is going to reflect that. Uh, and then I and. and <laughs> And then, and a week a week after I I say that, um, a but a buddy of mine a buddy of mine asked me if I would if I would DM because he managed to get a bunch of Sailor Moon fans together and wanted me to handle the DM work. And I'm like, why can't you do it? It's like, you're a better DM than I am. <laughs> and so did you end up running a Sailor Moon campaign? Yeah, I I was w- I was way out of practice with familiarity with with the show. So over the course of two weeks, I ended up bi- I ended up binging the whole series, just so that just so that I ha- just so that I could be properly prepared. Right. Um. I was using the one I was using the one that that um Guardians of Order had come out with back back in the day, which mm-hmm. still holds up decently, though since it is using Tristad, which is a universalist. Style game, the GM is gonna have to make is gonna have to take some extra work. Right. That's, um, I don't hold that against that game in particular because this is a problem with every universalist game. Yeah, it, it's just kind of part of it. Yeah, it's just it's just one of those things you have to do to make sure somebody doesn't break things. Um, oh, much as I much as I love say he, the hero system or or GURPS. Oh. Or even, or even Savage Worlds to an extent, it's mm-hmm. something you're gonna have to deal with. Yeah, um, I haven't run as much. Oh, actually, I've, I've run no GURPS. I've seen a little GURPS, and actually, had a, I think I played like one session of it before a campaign fizzled out. But like, 
it, it seemed to have a similar issue to Savage Worlds in that, like, you go to run a specific kind of, of setting and you're like, well, it doesn't have enough to support this stuff or these particular things become issues uh, in this setting. So, like, every time I've done a Savage Worlds game, yeah, I've had to spend at least, like, a week hammering out some rules to kind of make it connect with what we're actually trying to do. I've had, I've had sh with, with those kind of games, I've had short lists of this is what you can take, this is what you can't take. Mm-hmm. And when and whenever when sometimes sometimes people have cried foul and that and then I and and um then 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 I then I usually get I usually get on them for for to to remind them of the pecking order. Oh, um, it's not the first time I've had to do that. When I was when I ran a Doctor Who campaign, I had I had said none of you are time lords. You're all working for Torchwood. We're getting that out of the way right now because I know one of you is going to ask. Yeah, um, I, I I definitely had the experience. Um, people, you know, people do love to gravitate towards certain particular things. There's always at least one person who will try to find either the broken or just the, the thing they really want to introduce. Um, even with the Mecha campaign, when we were doing characters at some point, I think when we did, like, he was making a new character. Uh, he started trying to like add in some kind of crazy high concepts like what if i had like nano machines that can do this and do this and do this and i'm like just no we're not doing that i said this a while ago no like we're, i we're... usually write i usually write out a primer for my players yeah which it basically goes into the tone what are the good ideas to go with what are the bad ideas to go with um just as an example a while i've used this example a few times but when i ran lex arcana I had mm -hmm. made explicitly clear to the players, this is going to be an investigation-leaning campaign. Combat is going to happen, but do, but do not rely on it. Mm -hmm. If you end up if you end up making a combat machine, knowing this, you have only yourself to blame. Yeah, I I can I've definitely done that. I usually do that in like a session zero. I guess I don't really write it. I should actually write it out. To, to be told, but usually what I do is a session zero where I'll just be like, hey, this is what we're doing. And we had an instance where uh, we were playing Open Legend, and I was like, we're running like an intrigue game that's going to be a lot of social uh, stuff. It's going to be a lot of, of, you know, deception, lying to people, you know, keeping track of, of social connections. And somebody was like, they made a, a dwarf who dual wields shields, who is an anti-social combat machine and by session like six he's like i'm kind of bored and i'm like didn't i tell you this is going to be like heavily a social game and he's like i didn't think about that for some reason i'm like well let's i, I probably should have said something earlier to be like hey do you want to change characters but uh i thought i had made it clear initially if i was in that same position i would have had him drink the pain glass <laughs> Which is a is a punishment. The pain glass is a punishment game that happens at my table whenever somebody gets caught cheating or they do something ridiculously stupid. Mm -hmm. um, you have two options. One of them is to drink a full bottle of bacon soda. Oh. Which it tastes about as foul as you think it does. Oh yeah, I I can picture it. Um. Imagine if someone imagine if someone makes club soda with bacon grease. That's what it's like. Well, that's what I'm picturing. Yeah, I just like the the oh yeah. Uh, okay. What's the what's the next thing? It is a shot glass feel. It is a shot glass that is full of the following: water, salt, sea salt, pepper, black pepper, Tabasco sauce, sriracha, Frank's red hot sauce, tiger sauce, and ground up jalapeno seeds. Those both sound pretty bad. Those both sound pretty bad. Well, if I'm gonna call something the pain glass, I have to deliver. Yeah, no, that's that certainly delivers. <laughs> I wouldn't want to drink either of those. I might take the bacon soda over that, but I mean, I don't think either are good options. Well, that that's the point. It's it, it's yeah. meant to punish someone for doing something stupid. That's a good idea, honestly. Uh, but when it comes to that whole broken builds thing, yeah, I remember Ralph Coster. And who's who? Um, I think anybody who's interested in game design should read his book, A Theory of Fun. Mm -hmm. When he was lead designer for Star Wars Galaxies, he was adamant about not putting Jedi in the game. Yeah, yeah, I actually think I remember hearing something about that. 
his reasoning was that Jedi would be an alpha class and everybody would be chasing it. And he only he only put it in after, he only put it in in the NGE era because because Sony Entertainment forced him to. I always wondered what was about because I remember everyone complaining about that uh, change. Um, I actually had a couple friends that that used to play it like ages ago, and and I remember hearing some of the stories about the change with the Jedi to the um, NGE stuff, and I'm I, I wondered why he had done that. So. That was the reason why he made why he made it so that you had that you had to go through all those steps with first being force sensitive, which was a dice roll, and the second find finding a sufficient amount of holocrons hidden on the map. Mm -hmm. Of course, once the community figured out where they were hiding, the fat lot of good that did. Yeah. But and the, and it's it was for similar reasons that I did that I didn't want anybody to be a to, to be a time lord. I've I've been cr I've been critical of games that are based on IP about whether or not they're trying to replicate the show or replicate the setting the show takes place in. Mm, yeah. Uh, I remember when when everybody was talking up a storm about about the about Avatar Legends, I looked at the I looked at what they were planning and, and I had that question and it felt it felt more like Given that they were adver that the way they were advertising it, it felt more like they were interest they were more interested in replicating the TV show rather than the rather than letting people use the setting as a sandbox. Right. Oh. I mean, I suppose that makes some sense, if only because I, that's kind of like I guess the selling point. If somebody just sees Avatar and they're like, "Oh, I have a lot of fun with the show. I would like to do a game like the show." And that's not everybody's want, but I, I'm assuming that's kind of what they're going for. Yeah the the problem the problem with doing that is is mm -hmm. eventually is that puts a low that puts a low ceiling on what you can do. Yeah. There is there is also the fact that what it, what if somebody at the table isn't as familiar with the show. But yeah, no, that's a, a fair point. Um. I remember I remember running a Avatar themed campaign once using. Um, using Legend of the Elements, which is a powered by the apocalypse hack, mm -hmm. and instead instead of in, people had figured out that it was that it was set that it was set in Avatar's universe on their own, but initially I had told them this is going to be this is going to be a high fantasy setting with some elements of Wuxia and steampunk. Mm -hmm. I didn't t I didn't tell them that they that they were that it. I didn't tell them that we were doing it in the Avatar universe, uh, and I specifically chose a point in time where that where it would be trickier to put two and two together. Not not to trick them, but ju but just to keep them from bottlenecking the kind of characters that they'd come up with. Right. No, that kind of makes sense. I think. And hell, and hell, I told I didn't the um, game that I used as a reference for for them wasn't even. Wasn't wasn't anything Avatar adjacent. I was I had brought up Jade Empire to them. I I could kind of see where yeah you would use that as a reference. I mean it's close enough without without directly being like hey we're doing Avatar. Mm -hmm. And now when when it came to when it comes to all when it comes to all systems go. Mm -hmm. um, now I know I know this is some, I know that that development is in flux, but mm -hmm. was there was there a point in time where you, where you had where you had felt that you had stre you had stretched things as far as you could as far as using Savage Worlds's setup? Um, yeah that that's part of what made me want to make one was well. I had actually played with the idea of just really refining as much as I could, and I and I had pushed it pretty far. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and by pushed it, I mean the the mod that I was working on for it. Um, I thought about just polishing that until it was basically done and releasing that, but I kept running into particular walls. Uh, people wanted more and more like options for characters. And like certainly that leans into like making it a little bit more crunchy in some ways. Um, I don't really mind. Uh, I obviously don't want to go crazy, uh, 
but Savage Worlds felt like you could only add so much in terms of like bonuses and extra abilities and stuff like that before you start getting like uh, some insanely broken characters that start to really mess up the system. And while I don't think like where we were at when we were running tests for it, we weren't quite there to having completely broken characters. We were already getting there, and we'd already we'd only like been a a like a year in of playing kind of sporadically because we couldn't play like every week. We we had to take breaks. And um, and I was like, well, if it's already starting to show signs of of breaking, then like. That's going to be an issue if I, no matter how much I polish it, unless I just really hold back the advancement. Um, and I wanted a lot more depth out of uh, mecha customization, like being able to like build a, a mech that was like interesting. And that's kind of where I started looking at um, like Lancer and Mechton and like going back and revi- reviewing them, which it's it's kind of amazing. I think I. I think I remember reading through uh, basically all of Lancer like a year or two ago, and I managed to forget most of it at this point. But um, if only I could be so fortunate. <laughs> I I am a, I have a really bad memory, unfortunately. Um, did you? I'm curious about that statement. Uh, did you not like Lancer? No, or... I, no, I I like Lancer. I'm just say I'm just saying I do, I I have a hard I have a hard time forgetting certain things. Okay. Okay. Um, no. I liked Lancer, but it is, but it is a little bit too. But a lot of people have this idea that you can use it to run any sort of um, any sort of any sort of mech. But it's it's much like World of Darkness. It's far too married to its setting. Yeah, it's an interesting setting, and some and some of the mech des- and there's and the mech designs within Lancer run the gamut between. The kind of things you'd expect to the Kent to the outright weird, looking right looking right at you. Every mech coming out of Horus. Yeah, they're all of their mechs are bizarre, and you start getting into some interesting like psychic stuff, which is kind of cool on its own. But like, if I want to run like, you know, Gundam, like the One Year War or something, I'm like, I couldn't do this really. Like, eh. well, there's some stuff that I wasn't even gonna reference Gundam with some of the weird out stuff that they do. Some of the stuff. Le- Leans far more leans far more into, um, in into high, into high concept stuff that doesn't have an analog like, like um m- like mimetic virus weapons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that too. Um, it gets a little crazy. That was actually one of my main reasons I I didn't want to run Lancer personally. Um, not that the setting is uninteresting, but that like for the type of mecha that I and my groups typically enjoy, I was like, that's not really my thing um nothing against you know the setting itself it's interesting i just oh. not necessarily into it i'm ge- i'm guessing you prop and i'm get i'm guess and this is probably the case with all systems go you probably wanted to lean more into the more into um into into a into a more gundam adjacent approach yeah uh for sure um i took a lot of inspiration from like Armored Core and Gundam primarily when I was building the system itself. Um, oh, so I know you're Gundam a, you're a raven. varies. Yes, uh, I those were like my bread and butter games as a kid. Um, Just shot I, in the shot in the dark. But did you ever at any point play Zone of the Enders? Um, yeah, actually, I'm trying to find another copy of it because I don't have my old copy, but um, I want to play it, it again. Um, I, I'd have I'd have liked to see. I had played through all. I'd played through all three, um, mm-hmm. and I think the Fist of Mars was my backdoor introduction to Super Robot Wars. Pro- probably because it's the same company. Is it really? Wait, really? Yeah, the the Fist of Mars was Ban Presto. Huh. Okay. They're not known by that name anymore, but Ban Presto was the t- was the team f- when it came to Super Robot Wars. Okay. I only ever played the first, to be honest. Um, the I know there's sec- a two. Yeah, the second, the second runner, or m- more recently, um, Mars, is the is the superior one in every aspect. I'm gonna have to be gonna revisit that franchise then, because like I said, I only played the first. I enjoyed it a lot. Uh, never got around to second. There's a third game. Um. There, no. there's been, 
The first one, chronologically, the first one, or not chronologically, in release order, the first one was the original one mm-hmm. on the on the PS2. The Fist of Mars was a tactics RPG approach that was on the Game Boy Advance. Um, and then came a PS2 sequel called The Second Runner, or in Japan it was known as Anubis. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, I, I didn't know about the GBA game at all, actually. The, at which... Would get a which would get a re, which would get a re-release in the form of the HD edition on the PS3 and the and um, a few years later a a another re, another re-release in the form of Mars, which also added VR support. Huh, that's interesting. Ah, uh, th- but the original Zone of the Enders hasn't gotten re- hasn't gotten a redo except for that HD version. That's on. Is that on PS3? The HD release. Yeah. Okay. I don't have a PS3 anymore. Um, and finding PS2 copies of of that's published by Konami. The first game, right? Um, all of them have been. Okay. Which yeah. Is... For some reason, Konami games are so hard to find physical copies of. Don't don't I know don't I know it? I was still. I wish I. I wish I hadn't lost my co- my copy of the of the early um Suikoden end games. Yeah, I've been trying to find like a copy of, Ca- of Symphony of the Night that's not like ninety dollars. Uh, sometimes they go up and down, but it's it's hard. And then finding them in like local stores is nigh impossible. I um, I actually managed to get a copy of Silent Hill two, like a like a uh, full full case game uh, manual, the whole nine yards, uh, like a couple like about a year ago, but like. I got it the same day it got in the store. And I asked, I was like, how often do you guys have copies of this game? And he's like, basically never. So uh, good luck finding the other two games. And I'm like, well, shit. Well, you can always I still, go with the yeah. HD collection. <laughs> uh, I don't I can't I even mean, finish that sentence. No, no. I mean, if, I re- if I'm really desperate, I could try, like, the awful PC ports. Because <laughs> I think 3 has a PC port, and I think it's also awful. Maybe I'm thinking of 2, but... Oh. Uh, I th- you honestly, you probably are. Um, uh, it's just, it's just I had to. As my mentor would say, I'm not trying to hit a man while he's down. I'm trying to kick him because that's easier. <laughs> but yeah, um, and I will. That do, that does bring me to one, to one particular thing and something that I'm pretty sure you struggled with with mm-hmm. um with trying with trying to adapt with trying to use Savage Worlds' system for for mm-hmm. and and something that a lot a lot of game that a lot of game does would struggle with uh, and that is air ba- that is some that is air based combat or do- or dog fighting when it comes to mechs which. I think is going to be one of those inevitable questions that gets asked. Mhm. Since it's very obvious that for a lot for a lot of for a lot of um a lot of mech, a lot of people who are involved with mech anime, um some more directly than others, Top Gun was a major influence. Oh yeah. I mean if you li- if you look back at the opening for say Stardust Memory, it's very obvious they wanted da- they wanted Danger Zone, but they couldn't get it. <laughs> um, yeah, but, that's a good point. Um, a good but a good buddy of mine met- messed with the audio to to see to see how well it syncs up, and it syncs up a little too well. <laughs> it's been it's one of those things where it's it's clear they want it's clear they wanted it, but Kenny Loggins probably said no. Yeah, that's probably a hard no on that one. Either that, or he said yes, but the pr- but the price for it was too high. Mm, no, that's yeah. I could I could certainly see that happening. Um, but the f- but because of, because of that, the whole idea of dog fighting of outmaneuvering is something is something that's a hallmark, especially in something like Macross. Mm, yeah, yeah. I mean, you're you're as familiar with the Itano Circus as I am. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and yeah, oh, go ahead. That's and 
it's one of those questions that's inevitably going to get going to get asked unless unless you outright state that you, that um that is meant that is meant more for boots on ground styles of combat. Um, I mean, I that's like it is a struggle. Is I'm gonna start that because uh, making like rules for that kind of combat and just in general with RPGs because I've tried kind of playing around with some systems outside of ASG to see how feasible it is and it's certainly doable, but um, it's also another story when you try to apply that to a system that already has some base rules and mechanics. Um, I'm mm -hmm. kind of trying to figure out something for that because yeah i love the whole dog fighting in space thing i absolutely love you know outmaneuvering um i love the the thematics of a one-on-one -on -one duel in space that you know is just kind of sending the two characters all over i mean even gundam has some of it macross obviously it's macross um it's unfortunately not a thing at the moment in the system because it's it it does have a little bit of war game elements in that you know there there's a board there's measuring distance there's the whole nine yards um so it has those and then uh it kind of makes me think of like have you ever seen like chase mechanics in games so they're usually a really distinctly different kind of combat encounter like their yeah. mechanics are just work different that's kind of where i'm i'm having an issue of like you know, either I can take that approach and make it a separate set of mechanics that are different for like dogfighting in space, or try to find some set of rules that make it work well with the the wargaming approach. Um, now, there's a lot. There's obviously a lot of a lot of different a lot of different takes with wargaming, and as far as what advice yeah. I could give, um, I'm li I'm limited because I'm not I'm not quite sure what core mechanic you'd you'd want mm -hmm. to go with. At this time, but I will I will admit I ha I have a I have a soft spot for the for the um, maneuver system with with chases that's that's used in stuff like Legend System and Spycraft 2.0, where you, where both where the chaser and the chase have have different um different maneuver options. Okay. Um, I think I think what it I on when it comes to trying to do a integrated take on 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 dog fights if I'm if I'm being if I'm being honest I think I think it would be tricky to do in a in a more wargamey approach if only be, if only because of the sheer amount of units that you'd have and that kind of thing Yep. Because what what dogfighting ultimately I remember I do remember I do remember taking taking a philosophical approach that dogfighting is another form of dueling. Mm hmm Yeah. Since what you're what it really is is pe is two people trying to trying to outmaneuver and countermaneuver each other to get a distinct advantage. Which isn't too far removed from 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 an from a Errol Flynn style swashbuckling kind of duel, and I think it I th I think that I think um that kind of approach of of it of it being that sort of clash, I think is the I think is the best way to look at it. But that's just me. I mean, I, I definitely I. I definitely, I think, agree with you. Um, I actually got to look into Legend Systems and, and Spycraft there because uh, I have been trying to find something that I think would, would gel pretty well or something that'd be interesting. Because, um, yeah, the main issue when you have, I feel, any kind of dueling one-on-one -on -one type uh, mechanic is is if there's not enough variety in the options and choices or even just flavoring, I suppose, but mostly options and choices like mechanically, uh, it kind of gets into a stale um not a stale mate but it just becomes very stale you have character a roles character b roles you just kind of keep going back and forth for a while well, um, you also you can also run into the hacker problem or the or the duet problem oh yeah oh um, because just to use an example with with because of how people set up teams in something like Shadowrun or mm -hmm. cyberpunk you could have you. It's very easy to have one person designated as 
the hacker or the net runner. Mm -hmm. The problem is when they're do when they're doing their hacking slash net running, it's very easy for for the get for the game to turn into a duet between the between the hacker and the DM while everybody else is just sitting on their sitting on their asses. Yeah, we we actually had that experience when we played Shadowrun. Um, it was years ago, but we had one player who uh, wanted to be the hacker. I think it's an interesting archetype. People see that and they're like, oh, that's going to be so cool. I'm going to be the hacker. And they like put all their points into nothing but that. And even if you're like, hey, maybe you should like diversify a little bit, because if you're not hacking, they're like, you know, you're not going to be doing things because your character isn't useful to these other stuff. They usually go, no, I'm going to do this anyways. And then what you end up having is, yeah, this that exact problem. Where they're sitting there waiting, and then they finally get to do their part, and everyone else is waiting for, you know, 45 minutes. Because, to be frank, the hacking mechanics in Shadowrun, and I hear Cyberpunk is just as bad, uh, are kind of slow. I prefer... I prefer... They've, they've gotten they've gotten better... Mm -hmm. Over the over the years, it's n it's nowhere near as bad as it was with um, third edition Shadowrun. Mm -hmm. Um, but there but um there are there but there are other there are other options that I find promising. While it's not out yet, I'm very interested in the hacking mechanics that the Vault is currently working on because I think I think that I think they have their own way of addressing the problem. Um. And Infinity, both both the war game and the and the RPG, um, their their approach to the problem was to make it so that ha so that hacking wasn't just getting past locks or getting past security, but something that could actively be used in combat. Oh, okay. Oh. And I'd say I'm not gonna I'm not gonna say either way either way is better. But it's more. It's more about. But it's more about making making it so that the dedicated hacker always has a way to contribute instead of this one thing that they have a monopoly on. Yeah. No. For sure. I. I think that's. Yeah. It's. It's. It can be fun the other way, but like just being able to help them contribute. It's like you know they want to be engaged at the table. Otherwise, they're gonna just kind of tab out, pick up their phone, and start doing something else until they're good to go. Yeah. And when it com when it comes to when it comes to do when it comes to dog fights, if I w if I was mm -hmm. to do if I was to do that for something, um, I'd prob I'd probably have dog fights as the as this as this one. It wouldn't last any longer than a round, and it would basically be this hot be this um, high risk high reward kind of kind of role. Because you'd you'd either do you either do very well at it, or or you or you'd leave yourself exposed. Right. No, that I, that makes sense. Um, I think that's not a bad idea. Um, I I certainly also can see what you mean about it has the potential for that the the hacker problem of like, you know, if the combat takes a while and you go through many many rounds and it's just these two, it it's gonna have the same issue. Mm -hmm. Um. And I mean, there are there are times, especially like especially if you're doing a space battle. There's going to be times where the party isn't entirely together. We've done space battles, um, and we've had that not the exact same issue, but a similar issue of one player is off doing this other thing, and the other one is having a duel with a character, and it has that issue yeah. where you have to either like the way I've done it as a GM, and this is maybe not this is a band aid for a problem, but the way I did it as a GM was like I just kind of bounce back and forth, and that kind of worked. But mm -hmm. I think it'd be better to have a dedicated set of rules that make it fun for everybody rather than, you know, it, it being like a, a half-baked solution of let me juggle two different combat scenes. Although when it, co when it comes to the concept of the duel, um, mm -hmm. I do think Tenra had an... In when it comes to those one-on-ones, I do think Tenra had an interesting approach. Um, Tenra Bancho Zero. Of the of other players being able to contribute through through the whole key I and I key mechanic that the game has. Oh, okay. Um, Tenra, for what it, for what it's worth, I had jokingly called the most Japanese game I'd ever I'd ever played. <laughs> um, and I'm not just saying that because it's a TTRPG that was made in Japan. It has to do with a lot of the uh, a lot of the subject matter. Oh, okay. 
Um, I haven't really heard much of it. I I reviewed it in my early days, but it was it was at that point in time when I was doing chapter by chapter breakdowns of full, of full books. Oh, okay. So it's not one it it's not one of my better reviews. Also the also the audio was crap. But the now, since you mentioned wanting to mm -hmm. wanting to custom wanting to customize wanting to customize Max, um, yeah. One question that I have, just as a general direction thing, is: mm -hmm. Do you plan on you do you plan on utilizing a a small set of mech archetypes for people to build around, and or do you and or do you plan on going freeform? Um, at the moment, it's freeform. Um, it's gone through multiple iterations because, uh, as you probably know, anytime you have a large amount of customization or crunch, there are pitfalls uh, that you run into. Oh, that yeah like tons and tons of them and this is both as like as a player looking at customization and as a gm or not gm sorry as a designer trying to like not let them fall into those pitfalls or making it like not as as easy to do like you know if somebody has to go out of their way to gimp their character that's i, I you know maybe that's okay but if it's like an easy thing to do that like you know 50 percent of your players end up gimping themselves by bad builds then Maybe the system is the problem. Um, so at the moment, it's it is a it's a bit more open. It's not really archetypes. It's more of you pick part by part kind of thing. And there's a there's a there's a whole stat system. It is a little complicated, although it's it's not it's not anywhere near Mechton, uh, if I remember right. Because Mechton had a pretty in depth customization system, did it not? Yeah, even more so once you throw in Mechton once you throw in Mechton Zeta Plus. Oh which yeah, is I forgot that was a thing. Which is where they started introducing fucking combiners. Yeah. <laughs> uh, although to be fair, it's a it's a it's meant to be the advanced rules, so yeah. you get what so you get what you have coming. But when I when I when I meant what I meant when I said archetype is mm -hmm. not necessarily class in mm -hmm. in the in the sense of character class, but either either something like a a general role, or or ge or general size. The way, say, um, BattleTech has has scout mechs, medium mechs, heavy mechs, and assault mechs. Oh, okay. Um, it, it's funny you mention that because that is actually how it worked in the original Savage World system that I, I set up. Was it was it was light? I think it was light, medium, heavy, super heavy. Which I think I might have just taken straight from BattleTech. Um, mm -hmm. I I don't remember where I got that idea, but uh, this time around, no, I made it. I, it's much more open. You can kind of design what you want, and that was sort of the one of the major like pitches when I started working on this was just having a bit more um, freedom on the players' end to be able to do what they want with it. And so far, it hasn't been too complicated for people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that I feel like that's with such a small player base, uh, or you know. I'm trying to actually know. How, I'm trying to think how many people have actually had tests the the mech side of things, but um, it's probably less than ten. With such a small number, it's hard to say whether or not it's actually intuitive or not. Mm -hmm. um, now, yeah, I don't. See, oh god. Given given that given that, um, I'm curious if you have if you have any plans for some for some sort of upper limit when it comes to it, like. Like the way weight was in Armored Core, just to use one example. Yeah, um, that is... So admittedly, uh, I'm currently actually redoing a bunch of stuff about the mech building, uh, mm -hmm. but that is currently one of my major uh, sort of caps is things like weight, so that uh, there is an upper limit. There are advantages to having less weight. There are advantages to having you know more weight in some ways. Um, yeah. But there is a point where it's like you your mech cannot support slapping on thirty different guns uh, because I think you know th there has to be a, a limit to the number of options you have. Otherwise, you're you're just going to go for as many as possible. Mm -hmm. We actually kind of had that issue in the Savage Worlds version because, like I said, it was slapped together in a week, uh, and people really quickly figured out with with as it was, uh, they were like. Oh, I can just slap on as many of these things as I want. Okay, I'm just gonna keep doing that. And I'm, I was like, oh no, 
I forgot. I didn't think about that. Yeah, I um, when I've done when I've done my own when I've done my own takes in the past, I do remember using weight class and saying okay, and I, and I had it as a as a kind of um, point system. Mm -hmm. you had, your weight class your weight class was basically the the um, base chassis. Mm -hmm. Um, you could add on. You were going to add on to that with uh with wet with weapons and systems, but it was always to a certain limit. And depending on the weight class, certain things were not going to be you could you outright could not equip. Um, if you had a light chassis, you could not equip a rocket launcher. Just a, just as just as one example. Yeah. Yeah. Um. I, I will admit that not having said archetypes or weight classes has proven a bit of a challenge because as you kind of pointed out, you can, with uh, an archetype, you can very easily say, okay, lights cannot equip these things because they're light mechs. Um, instead, there, you know, there are a lot of testing on my own. I've, I've certainly noticed that if you leave it open, you certainly will get uh, some wonky builds where people are like, I have the lightest mech possible, but I slapped on this heavy ass weapon. Uh, I don't think glass cannon is meant to be that literal. Yeah, exactly. Um, people will do that too, just because it's like I, I would say my players do like to optimize, but just as much my players love to be like, I want to build the dumbest thing possible, and uh, it it comes out once in a while. Mm -hmm. Now. I'm ge I'm guessing th I'm guessing that you're also putting consideration for customizing pilots as much as the mech cuz they can't be in the suit all the time. Yeah, yep. Yeah. Um that is a huge part of it. Um Any particular aspects you want to ask about that cuz uh um what I'm what I'm more curious about is it is if that's if it, if that's just as free form with mech creation. Yeah, it is. It, it is just as free form. Um, I I kind of went with more of a um, a XP like you spend you you get XP you spend the XP um, on skills and I call them tricks. They're basically feats. Uh, and there are quite a few for combat, obviously, given that it's a mech game. It's about fighting. There's a lot though that are outside of combat stuff. Yeah. Um, I wanted to make sure that there was uh, a bit of a balance there, and that like characters could still have you know, a set of skills that they could use when they're not piloting for all sorts of different types of reasons, whether that's just, you know, flavor, roleplay, actual scenarios where they need the skills. Um, and it has come up because there are lots of times where a player finds a solution to a problem that is like, well, what if I broke into the building <laughs> and, like, did some reconnaissance? And I'm like, it... We actually kind of had that issue with Savage Worlds because when I initially... Uh, we did the stat array kind of the same way we would normally would. And naturally, because it was a mech game, people were like, dump everything into pilot stats. And then when they were out of their mechs, they were like, we can't do anything. We're terrible. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that that sort of scenario wasn't likely to happen. If not near impossible. Yeah. Um, I will admit for one of my experiments, I had, oddly enough, I ended up using Gundam Wing as as a point of reference. Mm -hmm. If only because when you look at the primary Gundams in that series, yeah, each one of them is tailor built for a certain theater of combat. For Wing, it's very much air and space superiority. Mm -hmm. um, Sandrock, desert combat. Um, Death Scythe, nighttime operations and st and stealth because of the amount of um, electronic jamming that it has. Mm-hmm. Um, Shenlo Shenlong slash Ultron. Um, I'd say he I'd say heavy foliage. You know, de des um jungles and forests. Places where you could use flamethrowers to do area denial. Yeah, yeah. Um, heavy arms. Urban. A lot of buildings, meaning a lot of choke points, so he can just sit his ass down and mow down anything that peeks its head out. I'm not gonna lie, I had never really thought about the the Gundams and Wing too heavily like that, but that that those all make sense. Um, admittedly, also I haven't seen Wing since 
I was a teenager, so. Like I said, I have a hard time forgetting things. Uh, I do remember when I brought up the stealth thing. Somebody, somebody, somebody had jokingly said to me, "How can, how can, how can a twenty-five foot, mech, how can a twenty-five foot mech be stealthy?" And I was like, "The same, the same way, the same way a plane can be stealthy. If everybody's looking at the radar, just make sure that the radar can't detect you." Yeah, I mean that's. We actually had a similar sort of thing um, at one point because uh, one of our players wanted to run a stealth mech. And actually, I have to, at some point, kind of redesign some of that stuff because it... Tangent aside, uh, the whole idea of having like a stealthy mech is kind of a neat idea, and I think it is certainly feasible. Um, I feel like it actually is surprisingly common in Gundam, too, but... Well, it's a, it's a it's a common tactic with mil with militaries. Period. Yeah, yeah. And at the end of the day, Gundam is a war story. Mm -hmm. uh, and heck, even even BattleTech has had has had mechs that have some degree of cloaking ability. Uh, and with and with it and. Because because of that, I've I've I felt that I felt that in, that um a good w a good way to mit to mitigate that is by having almost almost a almost a sister form of options and to represent electronic warfare. Oh, okay, yeah. Uh, whether it be whether it be j whether it be jamming or what whether it be um whether it be messing with messing with missiles, um. I would not. Re I would not recommend tracking individual missiles like that infamous Macross board game that I ripped oh. into a while back. Does it do that? Like individual missiles? It did. Oh. The game, this was a board game that came out in '88. Okay. Um, the I own. I will. I um haven't been able to play it. I only had a. I only had a half-ass translation of the instruction manual, but. My brother and I had 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 poked fun at how ridiculously complicated it was. That um, sounds agitating. A lot of the early war games in the in the seventies and and some and in the eighties were a bit cr were a bit crunchier than they needed to be, and I'll always remember the infamous campaign for North Africa with the biggest damn board I've ever seen. Yeah, I actually just learned about that recently. Um, I'm sure you might have heard at least at this point. Matt Kova was talking about how they were going to try to run a round of of that game, and I'm like, I started <laughs> looking into it. I'm like, this is insane. I'm like, what the hell is this? Um, you've probably seen this image, which I'm going to send you. Yeah. Just to that is that is the board for campaign for North Africa. Oh my god. Um, that is insane. Yeah, somebody had put it up on on Geekdo and just and just said, "The child, the child is there just for size reference." <laughs> that is nuts. Yeah. Um, I, supposedly, like nobody's ever finished a campaign, which I could believe because rounds take what, like, what was like an hour or something at the minimum. Um, I have people have finished, but I've heard more stories about the game starting fights in. <laughs> When when um when cer when certain people in the in in armed forces had gotten the had gotten the game, like I've I've heard more than my fair share of store of army stories about this game starting fights. So, to which I have to say, I, I guess in that re I guess in that regard, Mario Kart has a um li has a lineage to live <laughs> up to. <laughs> I I could kind of see how frustrating because I've seen some of like the the manuals for the game and I mean it's some manuals plural if I recall correct. Yes. Yeah, that's nuts. But I do um, I do like using that whenever once again whenever somebody complains about a certain game being too complicated or too many rules because I want to remind them just just how good they have it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, my uh, my significant other was just talking about like a Star Wars board game called like I think it's Queen's Gambit or something that has like three different maps and boards. And I'm like, you want to see something? So I started showing him some of like the photos of that of, 
campaign for North Africa. And <laughs> the worst part is like, I, I thought it was going to discourage him, but no, he actually kind of wanted to find a copy. I'm like, we're not, not doing that. We're not playing this. <laughs> Not unless somebody wants to sleep on the couch, I guess. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it, it it's interesting. Um, and actually, uh, complexity was one of the main because uh, you were talking about Macross and and rapid fire missiles and and mm -hmm. all that, and I was like thinking that's actually one of the main main things I tried to avoid with ASG was having really complex combat. Uh, I like my combats to be pretty snappy. Yeah, I um. You'd pro now give you admit you've mentioned a few times a, a kind of war game like leaning. Does that in does mm -hmm. that include um point management? No, when I say war gaming, I'm more meaning like the difference between playing like theater of mind versus having an actual board with tiles and and like you could do theater of the mind. I think uh, for sure. I mean, we have done combats in the theater of the mind. Uh, it's just. The, the game leans heavily into things like like having ranges, tiles. Uh, you don't have to use tiles. You can replace inches as well. Um, and it's more or less minis on a map, I guess. So when I say wargaming, it's not it's not that heavily into wargaming. Okay, that that cer that certainly makes sense. Uh, I think the and to be. I think the main reason that I ask is that when I when I hear war game, I'm think I'm thinking of points. I'm think I'm thinking of the way a war game tends to play, uh, whether it, whether it be skirmish or whether it be or whether it be um, grander and grander in scale. Uh, but it'd be kind of, it'd be kind of hard to do that and have a degree of mech customization, unless you want yeah. to, unless you want to end up like Robotech Tactics did. No, no, I. <laughs> I mean, I think it's an important distinction. I say war games mostly because I, I sometimes it can be, I'm not sure what word to even necessarily use because when you talk about D&D &D combat, some people like, oh, well, like, you know, they're like, oh, you mean like a grid and minis and like, yeah, you know, and then some people, you mentioned that and like the idea of playing with a grid hadn't even occurred to them, surprisingly. I, I And that's how I used to play a lot of D&D &D was without a grid. Uh, three is made, basically, it feels like for a grid and I never used it for a long time. Um, or used very minimal usage of it because I generally have maps and and uh, dry erase boards do work sometimes, but there's other times people just didn't want to bother. Mm -hmm. So when I say board game, it's more my odd terminology of trying to say minis and boards. That's fair. Um, and to and when when now when it comes to tech level, obviously. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you'd ha you'd have some leaning when it comes to when it comes when it comes to space travel, but or, mm -hmm. but I'm get I'm guessing some of the more far out there stuff like like nanites isn't go isn't going to be a common thing in the setting that you're considering for ASG. Um, yeah, no, definitely not nanites at the moment. Um, Currently, I'm kind of slowly cobbling together a setting for it, and I'm I'm honestly still debating how much I, I want to marry the setting to it because personally, I I kind of feel like I'd rather have ASG be something that ha that has some setting elements, but like can easily be moved around rather than it being tied down. Um, given th that's that, also my kind of game. So, given that, I'd re I'd recommend treating the setting as a possibility. Okay. Um. Something not too far removed from the visions in in Everway, where these are po these are possible worlds that you that you can go to. Um, the Strange has something similar, but then again, the Strange is all about world hopping, and so mm -hmm. is Everway to an extent. But the point it the point is within the with that this is a po this is a possible approach that approach that you could take. With the, within these within these systems, because if you're going if you're going that route, I'm get I'm guessing that you don't that you don't have a default tech level in mind for um, for the actual mechanics. So at the moment, I'm. Uh, hmm, trying to think how to word that. Uh, I feel like there's kind of there is a little bit of a default tech, but it's it's admittedly it's it's kind of wide um i sort of aimed it like a little bit 
I mean, it's going to sound like a repeat at this point, Gundam and Armored Core, but because I feel like those are kind of middle of the pack in terms of, of tech, you could go lower, you could strip out some of the, the higher end tech stuff and get, you know, it a little more simplified. Um, I mean, because like even even the idea of a mech being able to, you know, suspend itself in the air by flying is a thing that like some people would be like, well, that's too high tech for me. Um, because some, some mecha animes, that's not really a thing. Some, it's like every mech has, you know, some way of flying perpetually. Um, and then the other side of it, of if you wanted to go higher, you could probably add more. Uh, so that's why I use Gundam and Armored Core as, like, kind of my, my aim. I know they're not exactly the same, because depending on which Gundam I'm talking matters a lot. Mm. I'm thinking more like Universal Sentry. Yeah. Um, like, even late Universal Century does get kind of weird, but it still manages, I, I would say, to keep itself within reason. And given that, I'm guessing, I'm guessing that the idea, the idea that any sort of space travel would would mostly be uh, would still would still be within the er, still be within relative range of the Earth instead instead of um, some sort of FTL with other planets. Um. So that's the thing I haven't actually entirely decided yet, admittedly, because in our in our campaign, we do actually have FTL. We do have a pretty large system. Um, part of that is because that's just kind of what my group wanted to run. But for the system itself, I've been sort of uh, thinking that I might, um, yeah, tone it down to maybe more like around Earth, essentially. Because um, then there's also the topic of, of space travel in general and how it's mechanically handled. Um, because there's a lot of time involved in space travel. I myself have ta have taken, um, essentially the cowboy the cowboy bebop or, um, fading suns approach, mm -hmm. where FTL travel is possible, but only at certain po only at certain points in space. It's like, funny you. Know, oh, sorry. Go ahead. With cowboy bebop, you you can't. You need to go through a hyperspace gate in order to jump between planets. Yeah, I was going to say, it's funny you mention that, because when it came time to decide the FTL for the campaign, that's what we ended up settling on was gates, because I, I just felt it, it made a little more sense. Also, Cowboy Bebop's like my favorite anime, so, you know, I was naturally, that's the first thing I thought of. And everyone liked the idea of gates anyway, so like, that seems cool, it still lets us get around, but... Um, you know, it, it doesn't mean like every ship has an FTL drive. And I, I think if I were to do, if, if the, if the quote unquote default setting were to be bigger than earth, that's, I would probably go with gates, um, just to keep things simple. Um, I don't know how much I really want to lean into like spaceship rules and deciding how fast a spaceship can get from one location to another compared to another spaceship. Cause gates would be like, it's the same amount of time. It doesn't matter, you know, which ship in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, because I feel like in a mecha campaign, probably you're the part that people are itching to get to probably isn't the space travel. It's probably the actual combat type stuff, or the you know the scenario that the military uh, you know campaign is taking place in. And for Whatever. what it's worth, the appro the approach I've taken is it in in some of in some of my own projects has always has always been. Um, sort of this middle ground between a between aspects of um, ba of BattleTech and Gundam, mm -hmm. um, the the sor the sort of free maneuverability that you see with Gundam, but more in the sense that um, ship to that whole lot that full on warship versus warship combat isn't 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 as fr isn't as frequent because everybody's agreed to a set of rules. Most, mostly fair, due to yeah. the fact that whenever whenever people try and do ship to ship combat, um, planets tend to di planets or or cities or continents tend to disappear, and it'd be it'd be best that whoever whoever wins whatever fight happens that there's actually something to fight over instead of just glass. No, that that makes a lot of sense actually. I um, think BattleTech had that with the with the reason why the Ares conventions were made after. After during the Age of War, the final exclamation point commonly was dropping nukes. I actually don't know too much about BattleTech lore. Um, I didn't actually know that, to be frank. 
I always kind of wondered because I mean it does it does present itself as a pretty um, I don't want to say hard sci-fi that's not the right word but it 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 seems to take its its uh, setting pretty seriously so it do it does there's a, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff present and you have this mix of 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 t of stagnating technology with new with neo feudalist states. Um, and and mech pilots being mech pilots or mech warriors being seen akin to knights errant. Yeah, yeah. Um, but if, but the big reason why the why battle mechs became more of, became more of a thing instead of warships is, well, not to, not to put too fine a point on it, they're re they're cheap. <laughs> They're che they're yeah. cheap, and if 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 you lose if you lose a f if you lose a fight between me between mechs, you just lo you com compared to compared to the cost of losing a full on ship. Like I like I said, it's technically cheaper. No, that does make sense. Yeah, like ships would be insanely expensive to produce, so it makes sense that like yeah, sure, the sixty five ton mech is expensive, but not as expensive as this fleet over here or any of the ships in it. Not only yeah, that makes... a, a full-on warship would be expensive to produce, expensive to hire to hire a, to hire a full-on crew, yeah, and expensive yeah. to train the crew in the in the weapons platforms and the navigation platforms of that ship. Whereas with whereas with a battle mech, if you got if you all you need to do is tra is train is train a pilot. And if if the pilot ends up getting killed, you can always you can always put that pilot in you can always put a new pilot in that mech. And if the mech get if the mech gets blown up, it's going to cost less to replace a mech than replace a, than replace a warship. That's actually a good point. I honestly had not entirely considered that up to this point. Um, I'm pretty loose with my with my campaigns uh, that I run, just because it, unless it comes up, it doesn't necessarily have to get discussed. However, that has been a thing of like, I eventually need to get around to like fleshing out the setting in detail, uh, at least as an option, because I will say that I don't know how you feel about this, but um, I, I definitely ran into people and I can even say sometimes myself uh, where when you open up a game and if like the setting isn't really clear what you're supposed to be playing in, it can be a little intimidating the first time you're like, I don't know what this should look like. Analysis um, paralysis is what you're is the word you're looking for. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, I certainly would say it's analysis paralysis. Um because like yeah, once again the whole like, well what kind of mecha? And if you have a really clear idea, you're like, I'm gonna run Pacific Rim or I'm gonna run this, you can like base it off of that. But if you just get a set of rules and it says go at it, kid, it's like, well, I don't necessarily know what to run. Um, that's why, like, when my one friend, when we started, uh, was like, IBO, I'm like, that at least gave me a basis to be like, oh, okay, I know what that show is. I've seen enough of it. I can kind of build off of it. So that's kind of, at the minimum, what I would want the setting to be for is, is for people who aren't maybe sure what to run. Like, hey, here's a suggestion. Certainly use it. Otherwise, break it and make it yours. Mm hmm And... Yes. There's, oh, God. yeah, and there. It's there. There can be there can be fun in in breaking a a um system, mm -hmm. um, but I th I think it's important that 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 you don't that you don't that um somebody who manages to make a broken character isn't playing on easy mode. Yeah, I I will say that is um as I've uh, certainly learned over many years. I mean, and I saw this with Pathfinder in 3rd edition too. Um, especially 3rd, when you start adding anything past core rules, it gets really crazy. Um, I actually, I once ran a campaign where my players uh, had had kind of nudged me enough that they were like, well, let us use this and let us use that. And eventually I got so tired of them asking. I just like was like, all right, you guys, whatever you guys find, you can use. I did not realize the wealth of stuff you could find in random extended content. Uh, that was a horrible idea. Horrible idea. Um, yeah. But yeah, so for broken characters, I've had the experience of playing in other games. I, it is difficult to balance at times. Um, and it, it certainly can. Yeah, when you get a player character who has a character that is so absurdly 
powerful that they that they're basically running through on as you said easy mode and the other players aren't it it's a weird experience and usually it's not fun for the person who's overpowered well maybe for a couple sessions and then after a bit they start getting a little tired of it um the poster child i used for this this issue back in third edition is what i call codzilla i'm curious Cod meaning cleric or druid. Oh, okay. Because somebody who knows what they're doing with it, with either of those, is an entire party all by themselves. And yeah, somebody who can do somebody who can use both is is the kind is the kind of thing that gets thrown out at my tables. Yeah, I um we played a campaign for quite a while and we had a cleric and he wasn't even well like optimized and it, he was already like just arguably the the most powerful character at the table just using spells that were um like well just picking out really good spells, building his character decently well and then I got around to playing with some other people and they were they were even worse about breaking characters, and uh, one guy actually had a weird cleric fighter multi-class, and it was like an abomination. Mm -hmm. And uh, are you familiar with the legend of Pun Pun? You know, I think I remember it, but go ahead and refresh me. That was somebody's attempt to try and make the most busted-ass character possible by exploiting a loophole with, I believe it was the Evoker class, and making a kobold being able to take infinite levels and infinite classes. Oh god. And again, the he didn't use it for any actual character, but just as a, just as a demonstration that this th this if it was th if it was this easy for me to do this, maybe you guys need to take a look at things. Yeah, I think I, I may have remember hearing about that at some point. Um, I'm assuming that was third or third 3.5, more specifically, probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's what I thought. Um, that system is so unbelievably broken. Um, if you play, Especially if you play with a lot of extended content, it gets kind of nuts. Um, definitely trying to avoid that at all costs with ASG, honestly, because it yeah. people will sometimes try to be like, oh, but you know, that's fun for me. And I'm like, yeah, but like, you're playing with four or five other people, and when the when one of your players comes up with something that's so unbelievably broken, it, it can actually kind of kill the fun for other people. Um, to the point where we had one uh, one game where the fighter was so min-max. I, I was playing with, which is funny that the fighter was the most overpowered at the group, but um, it was because he was like really experienced with min-maxing and optimizing characters, and the others were complete novices no clue what they were doing and so he was so overpowered to the point where like they started being like just let the fighter do it and i'm like this is kind of backwards because usually it's not the fighter but it it was just in comparison to the others they felt kind of useless because he just seemingly could do you know all the stuff and granted fighters have tons of weaknesses i was poking them all the time um it, it just didn't matter anyways it made the other players feel kind of like well I can never even get close to this guy because, you know, there's all these options that I'm not going to spend hours looking through to make the perfect build. I just want to have fun. Uh, I do remember doing a Daka Wizard build, which was basically me was basically me saying, "How many magic missiles can I throw can I throw in one <laughs> turn?" Oh my god. The answer was 124. That's a lot of that's a lot of magic missiles. And remember, magic, magic missile. missile doesn't miss. No, yeah, just guarantee damage. Mm -hmm. uh, I granted, it, granted, it it's not good against enemies with spell resistance, but the whole point was to was to do the, a magic missile version of the Atano Circus. Yeah, that is. <laughs> it's actually kind of a funny build, but that would be agitating really quick. Yeah, I did. I did it. I did it just to see if I could do it. But, yeah. And when and. Given that, given that you're trying not, you're trying not to be over overly crunchy. It, it sounds like, um, mm -hmm. I'm guessing that you that you don't have any plans on doing localized damage. Oh no, um, you know, 
we tried that. Uh, I was curious. Um, there was a bunch of issues. Now we tried it in Savage Worlds, um, but all I did was I was like, okay, so when you get hit, you roll d6 and, and it denotes a part. And I think how I did it was I made each wound would apply some like penalty or disabling. So it's like, oh, if you get hit in the arm, you can't use the weapon on that arm. There was a couple problems, like people would forget they had the injuries altogether. People would forget what penalties applied to them. People would forget to roll the d6 a lot and would be like, oh, right, I have to do that. And so I'd, you have to constantly remind them. Even once we got into the habit of it, it just became like a very constant, like, oh, got to roll d6, oh, got to roll d6, got to keep track of it, got to keep track of which one was which. Mm -hmm. So when I actually sat down to make the new system, I was like, while it was kind of cool to roll damage and be like, oh, you got hit in the head and this disables this, it was just a headache to actually play with. Which is, cer is certainly understandable. Um, now what, now with that in, with that in mind, I know that, I know that you're current, I know that you're working on the thing and it's in very early access at this point, but yeah. do you have plans to release a, a, um, play test or a quick start version in the near future? Um, I'm going to take a bit of a cautious answer and say, I don't have a play test planned in the near future. I originally did have one. I thought everything was kind of shaping up nicely, well enough. I was going to, I think I talked about it a little bit on Twitter at some point, that I wanted to have a play test ready. And I was actually thinking February, but like a bunch of stuff happened. I had to redesign things, like really heavily redesign certain things because of... of I'm not going to get too much into the issues. It's, it's mechanical problems mm -hmm. um, that have been solved, but like... So at the point where I'm redesigning other stuff, I'm like, I don't think I can say there's going to be a playtest available in the near future. I, if I, in a perfect ideal world, I would love to have the playtest out sometime this year. Um, but, you know, things happen. <laughs> so I can't really settle on that. And with it just being me doing the actual, like, building and writing of things right now, um, it just takes a while to get through stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, if I had like if I had an editor or an additional designer, it it might be a bit easier to kind of like between you know multiple people toss it around. But with just me, uh, it's it's hard to predict. Yeah. But with that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to brave the hell of time zones and come all the way to my temple. <laughs> and. Anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking isn't mandatory, but it is encouraged. Oh yeah, some drinks would have maybe made that conversation a bit more um, interesting. But anyways, I really do appreciate you letting me on, coming and on and uh, talking with me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been a fun time. Yep. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>